All right, guys, so here's the beginning of part two of auto systems, and we're going to be looking at drivetrain systems. So we talked about the drivetrain components, um, transmissions, automatic and manual, uh, drive shafts, axles, wheels, tires. And now we're going to talk about different layouts of, um, of drivetrain systems. So the first one is what we call rear-wheel drive. So rear-wheel drive is when the engine up here is in the front of the vehicle and it's driving the rear wheels okay so typically the engine is mounted front to back so the front of the engine is at the front of the car so we say that it's longitudinally mounted so what you're looking at here in this picture it's a little bit deceiving because this is showing a sideways picture of the engine and transmission so that funny looking shape is the crankshaft and I've got one right here on the table to show you so if I just tilt the camera down, there's a crankshaft right there. And you can kind of look at that funny looking shape of main journals and what we call rod journals. Uh, this one's all black and blue over here. And that's because this one ran out of oil. And that's what was wrong with the car. It ran out of oil and uh, spun what we call a rod bearing. So in any case, so a longitudinal engine is mounted front to back so the crankshaft is the front of it's up here at the front of the engine behind the engines a transmission then a drive shaft now the picture is a little deceiving because this is a side view here but then we're looking at a top view here of the differential and you can see the the ring and the pinion this one's spinning this way and this one spins this way so we're changing the direction of rotation there's different number of teeth and diameter here so we've got some gear reduction and the gears inside here allow these two wheels to spin at different speeds but when we have the wheels being driven on the rear we say it's an rwd or rear wheel drive vehicle a couple of exceptions to this all the volkswagens from 1939 up into the um, mid uh, mid 80s and then all the porsches up into the 90s are rear engine rear wheel drive so the the engine is actually back here and the front of the engine is this way, the back of the engine is this way, and driving a differential here and driving the rear wheels. So that's a that's a rear wheel drive vehicle, but it's a rear engine or rear mounted engine drive. So anyways, that's rear wheel drive. And this is what most all passenger cars and trucks were all the way up until uh, the late 70s, early 80s. And then we started going to front wheel drive. So here's front wheel drive, FWD. And... This is where the engine is driving the front wheels. So the car is being propelled by the front wheels, essentially pulling the car down the road, whereas on rear wheel drive, the rear wheels were pushing the car down the road. When we have a vehicle that's a front wheel drive vehicle, almost without exception, but there are some notable exceptions, the engine is mounted transversely. That means that the front of the engine is over to the passenger side of the car and the transmission is to the driver's side. This is how basically every front wheel drive transverse mounted engine layout is with the front of the engine to the passenger side with the exception of uh, late 80s and 90s hondas they had the engine over here up until about mid late 90s had the engine over the driver's side and now honda's gone back to where the front of the engine is at the passenger side in any case we say that the engine is mounted transversely or across the front end of the uh, vehicle. Now you're putting all the weight of the engine and tranny over the front wheels. Well, in some ways that's, some people say in certain driving conditions that's good, in some it's not so good, but in any case it's a, it's a much more compact, inexpensive way of manufacturing a vehicle. Um, you don't have a big long drive shaft. Uh, you do have two CV axles, and we call CV axles because they're constant velocity axles and this is a constant velocity joint um, I showed you one of those yesterday it's more compact easier cheaper for them to manufacture etc so again here's the rear wheel drive with the engine up front driving the rear wheels and then here's the front wheel drive with the engine up front driving the front wheels some notable exceptions um, Subarus all Subarus used to be, at least passenger cars, used to be only front-wheel drive, and they had a front engine, but it was not transverse mounted. It was longitudinally mounted. Now all Subarus are all-wheel drive, but the engine is still in the front, and it's still a longitudinal engine. So the front of the crankshaft is over here. 
So the engine goes right into a transmission slash differential and drives the front wheels. And then out the back of the transmission, it drives the rear wheels. Okay, that's a super. So a little different. Here's a four-wheel drive system. First part-time four-wheel drive used on off-road vehicles. And older um, part-time four-wheel drives, you'd have to stop the car and go out, turn the switch in the center of the wheels that lock the front hubs, shift into four-wheel drive, and then you could go. But what you notice on, on these vehicles is there was a, the engine was up here, typically longitudinal. There's a trans, sorry, here's the transmission. This is a transfer case, driving the front differential and the rear differential. This is a little um, deceptive because the engine goes into, actually it's not, it's not deceptive, sorry, it's okay. The engine goes into the transmission and then there's a chain or gear that goes over and splits power to front and rear differential. So we drive all four wheels, okay? Full-time four-wheel drive is just a vehicle that's always in four-wheel drive. And that would be like a Jeep. So you don't have to lock the hubs and you don't push any switches. You're just in four-wheel drive all the time. Um, but, uh, but um, you know, so that's that's a better drive system for mud and snow and, and sand and, and those types of things. Um, most all vehicles today allow you, if it's a truck, they allow you to deselect four-wheel drive because it's better on the road, etc. But passenger cars have what we call all-wheel drive. It is four-wheel drive, but it's just a, um, a, a terminology that's ascribed to passenger cars where we are driving all four wheels. Okay, it's the same as four-wheel drive, just you, you can't deselect it. So this is full-time four-wheel drive applied to a passenger car, okay? Whenever we can apply power to four wheels instead of one or two, um, it's better because there's less chance of slipping, etc. So control is better, the ABS works better, the traction control works better. On modern car, older trucks and passenger cars where they were rear-wheel drive, the differential, if it had what's called an open differential, which is really beyond this class, literally one wheel drove the car forward. If it had a positive traction or limited slip differential, then both rear wheels would try to drive the car. So an all-wheel drive Subaru Outback or any expensive car has all-wheel drive. They handle really well. They don't slip as much when they're accelerating, etc., because they're strip, uh, distributing the power to four wheels instead of one or two. So... What we're going to do, let me just back up for a moment. What we'll do is, I'll, when I finish this PowerPoint, we'll pull the camera out to the shop. We'll look at some rear-wheel drive. We'll look at some four-wheel uh, four drive. We'll look at some front-wheel drive vehicles. We'll also look at frames and unibodies so you can see them. Let's go on and talk about different types of drive systems. Let's look at hybrids. So a hybrid is a type of drivetrain system, okay? So a hybrid, or HEV, which is hybrid electric vehicle, um, means that we have two power sources. We have either gasoline and electric, or we have diesel and electric. So <clears throat> two power sources. I put the diesel locomotive here because it's, it's, it's technically not a hybrid, but it does have uh, two power sources. What happens, it's not a true hybrid. Well, I don't know. I guess there's different ways of looking at it. But... The diesel engine does not drive the wheels. The diesel engine drives a generator. The generator makes electricity. And electricity spins electric motors at the drive wheels. The reason why they do that is because for that uh, train that weighs, you know, 200,000 pounds or whatever it is, um, to accelerate from zero, let's say, to um, 45 miles an hour, you'd have to have a gearbox with, I don't know, 30 or 40 or 50 gears to, because the engine only spins about um, 125 to 200 RPM. So you have such a giant, big, giant diesel engine um, spinning so slow, you have to have all kinds of gears to get it from, let's say, a standing still to up to 45 miles an hour. They get around all that. We don't have to have transmissions and drive systems, which might break under all the heavy torque. The diesel engine just spins an electric generator and the generator goes ahead and spins um, the electric motor, or the generator provides electricity to spin the motor. Um, hybrid type, so a full hybrid is where you have an electric motor powered vehicle, and the engine drives the vehicle and charges the battery only when the charge of the batteries get below 30%. So 
Um, a, a full hybrid could be considered, although many of the Chevy Volts, people thought of them as true electric vehicles, they were actually full hybrids, meaning the, the gas engine only came on if battery power was below 30 uh, percent. Otherwise, it just drove on an electric motor all the time. Um, a mild or assist hybrid, this is what I call a wannabe. It's a gas or diesel engine propelling the car. High voltage starter generator starts the car after coasting, braking, or a stop. So this is a car that we say has start-stop technology, meaning when you pull up to a stop sign, shuts the engine off. And by the way, everything new does this now. So when you're standing at a crosswalk, you'll notice cars sitting at the light are quiet, and all of a sudden, when the light goes green, you'll hear them start up and go. It's called start-stop technology. It's used to save fuel and to reduce pollution in the environment. So milder assist hybrids could be just a car that has start-stop technology. So if you ever wonder why uh, a milder assist hybrid like a Chevy Yukon doesn't really get that great a gas mileage, it's because the hybrid portion is, is barely doing anything at all. Um, so let's talk about hybrid layouts. So a series hybrid is where the car is driven by an electric motor and the engine is going to drive a generator to charge the batteries. Again, in the case of a Chevy Volt, that might be only when you're below 30% charge. So the batteries are going to drive the electric motor and that's a series. So series means one thing after another. So the engine can drive um, a generator to charge the batteries, kind of like a train, we call it in series. Um, but, but the vehicle is driven by an electric motor. A parallel hybrid is where you have basically two paths to the wheels. Both the engine or the electric motor can drive the vehicle simultaneously or parallel, meaning either or, usually, and, and they usually do that during acceleration or high speed. So the way a, a parallel hybrid works is usually the gas motor or the gas sorry, the electric motor will um, help under acceleration and will um, it idling the gas engines off and at low speed cruising or really low speed um, movement, the electric motor is propelling the car. But when we're cruising on the highway, the gas engine is propelling the car. It's a very small gas engine, gets really good gas mileage. So at low speeds, the engine shuts off and at higher speeds, the engine is driving the vehicle. A series parallel is a combination of these two. That's the Prius, meaning the engine can drive the generator to charge the batteries, but you can also um, drive the engine or drive the vehicle with the engine or the electric motor. A plug-in hybrid or PHEV is, um, you know, can be plugged into a charging station and may never run the gas or diesel engine. So, so in other words, here we're depending on a charging station to plug the battery or to charge the batteries and not necessarily the gas engine, although the gas engine could charge the batteries, whereas up here we're looking at one where you can't plug it in to charge it. The gas engine has to charge the batteries, okay? So most Priuses are like this, but plug-in hybrids are a little different. You can actually plug them in and charge when you're parked, let's say, at work or, or at school or something. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is we'll pause. Um, we're going to look at number four is electrical and number five is um, accessories. Neither take us too long, but let's pause here and pull you out to the car and look at some um, rear wheel drive, four wheel drive, two uh, front wheel drive, etc., and then frames and um, also unibodies. Okay, so here we are out in the shop underneath a 2003 um, Toyota Tundra. So you can see the Tundra up in the air there. We've got tires off and things. So what I want to talk about first, I, I started to show you yesterday the frame, which starts way up here at the bumper, all the way back down along here. There's the frame all the way up there, kind of rusty right there, all the way back to this uh, bumper back here. Hang on one sec. Let me get rid of this. So this bumper back here, a little rust here. We're going to replace that. And then all the way forward. So this thing is constructed with this big steel rail and that big steel rail. And then it has 
this cross support here and then this cross support here and then it's got another one right there you can see that one going across there and then it's got another one up there and that's the gas tank I'll back away a little bit there's the gas tank there and then so on it's a full frame car so it's a longitudinal engine so up here at the center there's a big skid plate right here we're up at the front bumper this is a skid plate here underneath it you can't see in there but it would be the belts and pulleys that's the front of the engine there's the oil pan the oil pan drain plug there you come back here that's this is where the transmission and the engine bolt up so this is the transmission right here this whole assembly here so from right there to right back here is the back of the transmission then this unit's called the transfer case because this is a four-wheel drive unit so the engine brings power like this coming back sorry my camera down here coming back like this into the transmission and then there's a drive shaft here that takes power all the way back to the rear wheels so there's the rear differential that axle is actually out this one's in i'm going to show you the axles in uh, just a moment i think where is it oh the axles down on the bench over there so you can't see it but um the reason why this car's in here is that we're replacing the axle bearing inside here that's the brake line that's an abs wheel speed sensor this is a parking brake cable that's where the the bearing goes so that's a rear differential there's the drive shaft and then the transfer case here has a big chain and then goes to this drive shaft and comes up over here to this front differential right here and this front differential has an axle going out to this wheel and an axle going to this wheel this is the axle right here this round shaft it's got a constant velocity joint under that boot and a constant velocity joint under that boot the other axle here has a constant velocity joint under this boot and a constant velocity joint under that boot um, that's the front disc brake caliper there and here's a front disc brake caliper there and there's the brake pads that squeeze against this rotor and these bolts is where the wheel bolts on he put a brand new spring and shock on there i think he did them on both sides yeah he did them on both sides he got new springs and shocks on both sides and um this car belongs to the new auto shop instructor at morrill bay high school who's actually teaching from san Luis high today so this is a full frame car it's uh a rear wheel drive but it's also four wheel drive so um, I'll go ahead and um, and uh, pause, and then we're going to look at a, a two-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive, and we'll also look at um, we'll also look at a uh, unibody front-wheel drive vehicle. Okay, guys, here we are underneath a Subaru. So this Subaru is a longitudinal engine. You can see the belt right there. It's a little dark. But that's the rubber drive belt accessory drive belt on the front of the engine so we're down looking towards the back of the car we're underneath it there's the back of the car this is the front here's the engine oil pan and the oil pan drain plug and a little bit of oil on the bottom here but subarus are longitudinal now they have an axle going to the front wheel so this is an axle and it's got a, a split open boot right there so this axle needs to be replaced and it drives that left front wheel on the right side there's another axle you can see the boot there the shaft and the other boot there and so you can see that two axles come out of this transmission and this transmission is a combination transmission and differential driving the front wheels going out of the back there's a drive shaft and you probably can see up in there let me look on the screen no you can't really see it it's too dark but the drive shaft goes down and i'll move this guy here to this back differential so here's the drive shaft here coming out there's a u-joint there here's the rear differential and there's an axle right there going across over here you can see the other cv joint boot see inner cv joint boot outer cv joint boot here's the driver's side rear axle outer cv boot 
inner CV boot. So you can see it's got a rear differential with two axles. So this is an all-wheel drive car. This is also a unibody car, and one of the ways you can tell, you don't see, on the unibody car, you don't see a big steel channel along here like we saw on the truck. But the body pan is just molded from what's called the pinch weld out here, all the way across kind of a molded rib for strength, all the way up to the other pinch weld. The pinch weld is the spot on the body where the outer body panel comes down, meets the underbody panel, and there's a spot, there's spot welds all along here. That's a spot weld there. These are all spot welds. All these little dimples are spot welds where the robots weld that on the assembly line, and they are robots. So a unibody is just sort of like an exoskeleton um, that's connected with the outside body and the underbody. We don't have any major steel structure. But you'll notice the suspension here is bolted here and here. So this form, this part of the unibody is a little stronger. But the whole engine, etc., cetera, is, is bolted in there. All right, sorry for that little pause. But the only other thing I want to say is that when we lift up one of these cars on the rack, we put a pad underneath the pinch weld. So this rib here is the pinch weld. And those two little half moon circles are the factory lift points for um, the factory jack so we're going to lift it on this rib we can lift it on this rib here and here but one of the things i want you to notice is there's not a lot of big structure in here this hook is for tying this thing down when it's being towed or it's on a ship coming from japan but otherwise that's a unibody car and that's a all-wheel drive vehicle there all right there we go all right, so next we want to look at our fourth major category of a vehicle, which is electrical. So electrical includes a number of subsystems, the first one being the starting system. So that is all the components involved in starting the engine. So we got a battery and we got a, uh, a starter motor. So the battery, which I'll call a B plus, so you see it up there, B plus, just my abbreviation for battery, is going to supply all the electrical power to start the engine. So the major load, uh, electrical load to the battery, is the starter motor turning the engine over. And most cars will run somewhere between 110 to 150 amps when they go ahead and crank the engine over. So that's the battery's job. It, it does have other jobs, but that's 90% of it. It, um, it will kind of help supply power if we exceed the alternator's output. Let's say when you have a big stereo with a with a base and the base hits and stuff like that. But you don't want to do that anyways, right? All right. Um, next is the starter motor. So the starter motor is going to spin the crankshaft and begin what we call the four-stroke cycle, which we'll be talking about very shortly here, not today, but soon. So the starter motor is going to spin the crankshaft, initiating the four-stroke cycle. So in the old days, they had a crank, and they would cr actually turn the crankshaft to get the engine started. Now we turn a key or push a button, and this electric motor uses battery power and will spin the crankshaft and start the burning of air and fuel and initiate that four-stroke cycle. The second subset of the electrical system is the charging system. And the heart of the charging system is an alternator, which is a DC generator. A generator is defined as any device that actually produces power. So this one's going to make um, alternating current power and we go ahead and, and um, sorry, I said DC generator. It's an AC generator. <laughs> okay. Um, it actually produces AC power, but then we convert the AC into DC. So somebody could argue it's a DC generator just because by the time it comes out of the diodes and there it is in DC. So the charging components involved in powering all the vehicle circuits. Um, so this is going to run everything once the engine started. So as soon as the battery gets the um, starter motor to initiate the four-stroke cycle and we, the engine starts to run, now the alternator is going to produce um, the, the DC electricity for everything on the vehicle. Cars run on DC, and the very simple reason is because we can't store AC. We can store DC, so we have a lead-acid uh, battery that's DC, so everything on the car runs on DC. Alternator makes AC because we can make more electricity more efficiently if we use an AC motor and just convert the AC into DC by way of a series of diodes. That's auto two. Don't worry about it right now. But the starting system, sorry, and the charging system are two of the subsets of the electrical system. 
The third subset of the electrical system is a computer control system. And cars have lots of computer control systems. Right now, I'm just kind of talking about, I've got two on the screen here. The powertrain control module is the engine computer. Body control module controls body functions like power windows and power seats and other things like that. We have transmission computers, anti-lock brake computers, airbag computers, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to use a computer, and that's a picture of an automotive um, PCM or powertrain control module. It's about six inches by about six inches and about an inch, an inch and a half thick, um, really small. Um, they are... They do a great job. They don't fail very often. Um, once in a while, they need a software upgrade, but they do not fail very often. We use a series of sensors to give information to the computer, and those sensors are, like it says here, components that send information to the computer. So it can decide based on, let's say, throttle position, TPS, oxygen sensor, O2S, and other inputs, how uh, what commands to make, say how long to spray the injector. Um, so sensors give input to the computer. Computer gives commands to actuators, and those are devices that uh, receive commands and do work, like this fuel injector. So we want to know how long to spray it, how long to turn it on, and how long to turn it off, for example, based on sensory input. And I put a picture of an oxygen sensor. The computer will get sensory input and give a command to this uh, fuel injector, which is called an actuator. So computers, in conjunction with sensors and actuators, get information and make commands um, to have different um, devices do work for us uh, in the car, okay? So the last um, and final subset here is um, accessories, or not subset, but main uh, grouping of an engine is accessories. So accessories are devices that you have on cars to make life nicer. You don't have to have them. So air conditioning, and that's an air conditioning compressor, makes cold air, and when it's hot, that's really nice. We have heat, and, and heat is considered an accessory. We use the engine's heat to warm the passenger compartment. We have a stereo. I know you think it's super, super important and critical, but we can't actually drive the car without a stereo. Power seats, power windows, power mirrors, power door locks, etc. Those are also heated seats. Think Subaru, Mercedes, new Chevy trucks, and lots of other cars have heated seats now, heated and cooled cup holders, heated and cooled steering wheel, really? Wow, okay. Um, cruise control, cruise control or speed control, these are the um, controls here. We can actually be going 55 miles an hour, push the on and then push set and take our foot off the gas and the cruise control will keep the car going at 55 miles an hour. Obviously, it's dangerous to have use if we're in traffic or car we're following a car too closely. Um, a lot of cars have adaptive cruise control now, where it'll actually slow you down and keep you a certain space from another car and different things like that. We have automatic headlamps. We have um, headlamps that that automatically go to brights when a car when there's no light coming at it, and then they dim down to low beams when a, another car is coming at it, etc. We have anti-theft devices that will turn on alarms if somebody breaks into the car or tries to put the wrong key in the ignition, etc. We have airbags like this one right on the screen here, which is uh, an accessory, although it's required now in cars and has been for oh, I think 12, 13 years, I think, since like 07, I think. Actually, maybe even before that. Um, but airbags do save lives. They work really well. I actually will show you a video on airbag deployment, etc. And that's basically it. But those are all accessories. Those are all devices that we have on car, and there's more. But those are devices that make the car more enjoyable, the driving experience experience more enjoyable and are easier, etc. But they're not considered critical um, components to the functioning of the car. Um, and so that's our fifth and final subset. So. I'll probably attach a video of an airbag going off with an explanation at the end of this. There you go.